to another episode of the Humming Projector podcast. Today we will talk about the celebrity that died in 1977. There were a few famous deaths that year, uh, like Charlie Chaplin, Joan Crawford, Roger Marx from the Marx Brothers, Bing Crosby, Alan Reed, the voice of Fred Flintstone. But if you ask anyone to name a celebrity that died in 1977, I bet most people would name Ben King. Not a regent, but the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. And with me today to talk about Elvis, I have an avid Elvis collector, Vince Wright. Welcome to the podcast, Vince. Thank you. Welcome to everybody listening. Hello. And uh, Vince, you have written a new book that's called 8mm Elvis. And to, to introduce you a little bit, I can mention a few things I have learned about you recently, and that's that you have been a fan club branch leader. You have run Elvis events. You have hosted Elvis radio shows and podcasts. You are an 8mm collector, and you have also worked at Duran, a firm that most people would know about in this community, I guess. So let's start off. How did you get interested in Elvis? Um, I think I've al I've always been behind the times, I would always say. You know, I, I was... An unusual kid of, of my age, I suppose like a lot of us here, who like the Laurel and Hardys, I like the Chaplins, where I should have been more up to date. And musically, I was always stuck in the 50s. I loved all my rock and roll uh, initially. Uh, and then uh, I sort of, I was collecting that, but I was only a kid, so I didn't have the greatest budget. And then, of course, Elvis died and, and you know, it everything became available and it really became high profile. Um, and, and it just took over. <laughs> yeah. And what fascinates you about Elvis? Why Elvis and not somebody else that was famous in, in the seventies? Um, I, well, I think you go, you go back to the fifties. I, I go back to this, uh, you know, it, the fifties was when they inter, uh, uh, invented teenagers. And I love this whole idea. You know, we can listen to punk in the seventies, but it was all done before in the 50s, wasn't it? The rebel, the you know, the parents didn't like it. And yeah. how dare you dress like that? Um, and, and I just I see that as Elvis died and punk came, it was like a rebirth. So I, I was really into this. I wasn't the rebel. I'd like to have been a rebel. I was <laughs> you know, incredibly boring. But uh, I did have a quiff. But I liked the magic of the 50s. And then... Uh, once I got into it, I found him a fascinating character, uh, and he could sing anything. And so I do like a lot of other music. I like a lot of other mo movies, uh, but I, I just got sucked into it, I think. Yeah, and for me, I was born four months before Elvis died, and for me, that can't remember anything. Um, how did that uh, how did this death affect um, the Elvis community? I mean, he was uh, had been famous for 20-something years, and everybody in the world knew who Elvis was. And, and when this happened, how, how was that, uh, and how did that affect the Elvis community? I, I mean, I, th I think it was one of those, you'll always remember where you were when you heard the news, when people, you know, the, the, those that were around at the time, will remember it. So... It was huge. It was it. People said uh, to me when Princess Diana died, it was like Elvis. It was in the papers. It was every program. It was every everything. So I think it was it was like that. I mean, I'm not saying they were the same people, but the 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 way the media treated it, it was that big. If you remember the Diana. Uh, uh, yeah. Princess Diana death. Yes. It was uh, it was everything. It was everywhere. It was every magazine had a couple color supplement. Everybody was selling badges. It, it was really just took over took over the nation. And I think that was the thing that you realised there might have been the great fifties, and then there were some weird films late sixties that were a bit iffy. But we kind of we we kind of re re found him and and i think when you said with bing and uh, uh groucho dying at the same time that was there was a you know there was this oh yeah weren't the marx brothers great so it was it was lovely that the the nation picked up on these yes and and he had been doing several things i mean of course he's known for his music but he was also an actor so uh, and he had started with his music and got gone to acting and then back to music again and um, so he had I mean, he's famous for several reasons. And I guess people would probably have collected a few things before his death as well. But I, 
I would presume that his death would affect the collecting world of Elvis. So how was the collecting world of Elvis, uh, the world of those that collected items and memorabilia from him? Uh, how how was that in the late 70s? Yeah, I, I, that was where, you know, things were being reissued because they, you know, LPs that hadn't been records that hadn't been around for a while. So everything came out and, you know, we were still weren't quite up to VHS. So we weren't the video days. So the, the eight mil filled a little bit of a gap, but it, obviously it was pricey then, but, but, uh, you know, people who, who were there from the fifties suddenly found that their collection would, would change hands at, at, at better money uh, you know, because there was there was a, a need for it, a bigger demand, perhaps. Yeah, and I and I was when I was looking into this subject, I, I realized I hadn't think been thinking about that before. But he died in 1977, and that's act the prime time of Super 8. I would I would call it. Yeah. So so it, the timing was like perfect for the, the Super 8 world. I had never realized that before. I started thinking about that now. Yeah, if you you know you look at sort of seventy six before he died, up to say eighty eighty one, yeah, uh, the companies that put stuff out, whether they were legal or not, they were a license to print money, weren't they? Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you have had this interest for Elvis for a long time, and of course, he it was all over the press, as you mentioned. But there have several uh, years has passed since then. And how did you get the idea for the book? Was it something that you uh, suddenly realized now, or have you been thinking about this? No, I, I, it's it's quite scary because um, it, during COVID and lockdown, and there was nothing else to do, I I got a box out of the loft, and it was all my research on this from the late 80s and early 90s because I just collected it and I made lists and I bought catalogues and I swapped and changed with people. So all my letters to collectors and, you know, I'll, I'll buy a lower from away from you and you can buy GI Blues from him. I found all this and uh, while it was COVID and I, I had very little to do, I, I started putting it together and I thought this could be a book and I thought it might be a little pamphlet a sort of a leaflet right. <laughs> uh, and as i of course the internet i got to see people like you know like yourself all over the world people going you know i've got this italian version i've got this japanese version i've got this and you're going wow and it grew and it grew and it grew um so ha, yeah that's the so that's the best thing to come out of covid is it sparked <laughs> this off um i'd been I'd, I'd been collecting in the you know in the early 90s where people weren't so keen i put an advert in the fan club and in record collector magazine saying i want your elvis eight mil and of course people were thinking well i've got vhs i don't need this rubbish uh, and, they, <laughs> and they and they you know i managed to get some really good deals uh so that so that that really that just took off and then i sort of got married had kids and you know life got in the way it all went on the back burner till covid really <laughs> And I can see in in the book you have a list of uh, contributors that have helped you, uh, I presume, uh, by providing material. And that list is impressively long. So I, I I presume you have learned to know a lot of people during this process. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, certainly from, you know, I think Jed's, Jed's uh, Jed Jones's um, uh, Duran page. Uh, it was great, and because I knew him from work and chatting to him, and he introduced me to to people as well. That you suddenly that, but all the little Facebook groups suddenly I could go. Has anybody got this Red Fox box? Has anybody got this? Uh, and it was lovely that the community came together, and and you know some people sold me stuff, some people sent me nice pictures, some people sent me a catalogue or whatever. Uh, so it was it was it was lovely. And and it is nice to see it now that it's a finished product, and yeah, you know, it's it's taken everybody to to make it so. And and uh, I, I find some similarities from my own uh, project, the other project I have that is the Super Eight database, but because I do a lot of the same, like contacting people, getting help to to collect material, so I I could find myself uh, in the little bit of the same situation as that you have been in. That database is, is wonderful. Uh, I mean, I'm not just saying that because here, but that is, you know, when I think Jed pointed me in that direction at one point, and you go, that's great. 
and and it, and it's one of those things that I go in looking for an Elvis thing. And then four hours later, I'm looking at Laurel and Hardy covers. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I go, I'm supposed to be doing something here. And I go, oh, do you remember that Tom and Jerry one? Oh, yeah. Oh, that was my favorite, uh, Harold Lloyd. And then, yeah, it, it, it sucks you in, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. That happens to me as well, even though I, I put all the data in with some help of, of friends. Um, and one of the friends you have got your help uh, from, as you said, is Jed Jones, and he has been uh, written the the foreword in in the book. Yeah, yeah, because because we worked together, it was nice that he was local, uh, so uh, it was nice to be able to go around, have a cup of coffee, uh, and then just go. Do you remember who issued the trailer of Double Trouble? And uh, yeah, and they go now, and I said, well, I've got this catalog from Thunderbird, and then they go, oh, yeah, and then this happened and that happened. Uh, so it was really nice to sort of grow and grow and grow that way as well. And it, it's nice that we didn't just talk about uh, Elvis and we did talk about the old days and sort of reintroduced me to people I worked with as well. So that was nice. I need to to describe your your book a little bit. I sit with your book in my hand right now and it's a beautiful cover, a uh, hardcover, I need to say that. And it screams instantly super eight when I see this. I have seen I'm seeing this cover, let's put it that way, so many times because uh, to describe it to the listeners, it looks um, very familiar when you have seen the Elvis from, from Ken Films. Uh, so, so I really like that. Um, how how do, you, do you come up with the design? I mean, I, I see you have your idea from the Ken Films, but uh, d- did you have any owner options? Was that, oh, yeah, no, this is no. how I want to do it? Uh, originally, I, I was looking at... Um maybe doing it sort of a four size um and and more like like an annual like sort of uh, you know the, the 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 specials that came out every christmas as a a book for for the the dandy or the beano or dandare or whatever i was initially looking at that format and then the the printers where i i went to they sent me the options and there was this sort of eight inch square was what they called uh, medium square. And I went, well, that's that's exactly what I needed. Um, and I thought about putting it in a white 600-foot box at one point um, and you know, just sort of scribble on the front. Uh, but I, I gave that idea up. But I love the idea that it could sit next to uh, your, your Ken film 400-footers and uh, it would just sit there nicely. So like, once I'd got that, um, I, I worked on 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 that, and, and my sister-in-law is a graphic designer, so I said, "Go and make this pretty," and she did. Yes, <laughs> my, and my compliments to your sister because it's I really like this cover. I must say that. And the book has a vast amount of Elvis material, as we have been talking about. That you have collected a lot of material for this book. But what kind of content could the listener expect when they get this book? Well, because I did it the the eight, the the eight by eight uh, the four hundred foot sort of square. I, I like that that I could put when I had good quality pictures. I could put a a cover sort of nearly real size so you could see it and some of them are all a bit creased and battered but i kind of think that adds to the effect uh, and others are, are, are you know, gorgeous and mint but it, it, it is all the covers of, of what i would say is all the legal releases uh, and then the you know the the debatables are, are also there as well but because a lot of things would have been a white box i haven't just put a million pages of white boxes with elvis through you know and that's just all that's written on the side in a pen or a, a rubber stamp so i've been selective on those but all the kind of given a taste of the variation of the of the way um red fox packaged them so you know you couldn't you couldn't just get every 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 one but it gives a taster of 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 all of these so it's really a little bit about the company to the non eight mil fan of, of who the companies were, what they released in what format. Um, so things like if, if double trouble was on a trailer reel with other films, I've put what they were as well. They've probably all been cut up. You know, I, ne- I only ever bought the Elvis trailer. I didn't buy the other two trailers that were on it unless it was 
something I particularly wanted, like the wild one or rebel without a cause or something. Yeah, and I, I think it represents the variety of the releases really well. As you have mentioned, different types of, of, of covers, clamshells, uh, cardboard uh, boxes, all the sorts of things. And But not only the physical representation of the film, but also the different types of content. Uh, you have digests, uh, you, you mentioned library prints, and, um, and, and presented really nicely with interesting facts about the releases and, uh, and things like that. A really nice book to, to browse through, I must say. Oh, thank you. I, I mean, I'd never written a book before, so I didn't really have any rules. So I did the book that I wanted. You know, I've wanted this book since 1990. I waited for somebody else to write it, and they didn't. So <laughs> it's kind of, uh, it's my baby. So thank you. That, that's, that means a lot. And the digests from um, about Elvis. Um, I mean, normally for a digest, you would get the highlights of the of the movie, of the story of the movie, perhaps, or maybe some exciting scenes. With Elvis, the songs are pretty important, uh, to say the least. How, how did that affect the digests? Do you think? I think some work and some are shocking. Uh, you know, you're always going to argue why is that song missing from Tickle Me, or why is that song missing from GI Blues? Or why do you only get a minute of it? Uh, but if you're playing with 17 minutes, you really are against the, the clock, aren't you? You know, trying to get it all in. Um, so at least they didn't all have that awful narration uh, that was so, so often added to, to digests. And a different side of it. Now we have talked a little bit about the official releases, but you mentioned other type of material available if you look for it um, because there are, are a lot of uh, you know, things that have been produced like bootlegs but also fan filming like people have uh, taking their camera and things like that yeah i mean that is that is particularly huge at the moment because a lot of that sort of footage was changing hands you know before if it was the original footage and they've been digitally remastered and there there are dvd series of it now so a lot of people in the elvis world don't know the elvis films they only know these dvds that have come out now with the fan footage so it's a it's an interesting time for that at the moment yeah and i found that from those parts really interesting because i mean i knew a little bit about the digest i mean i work with the super 8 database i've seen several of the covers although i don't know necessarily everything about the releases itself i've seen the covers but but this part was something i never have really thought about so uh, um, i was glad you included that in the book as well because that um, that was an interesting part i think i think that's that's you know that a lot of a lot of this with the eight mil where the, where where we say like when he died in 77, when you came to 78 and it was the first anniversary, everybody jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, so you would have, you would have things like three minutes of him at Madison Square Garden silent for $20 on a, on a 50 footer. Uh, and these were like, you know, full page adverts in places. So they must have shifted boatloads of them. And you, you couldn't just sync it up with the LP because it was three minutes of a of a you know, of an hour concert, and you can imagine if you filmed an eight mil, you you, know, you pulled the trigger, you, you filmed twenty seconds, then you filmed a minute, then you filmed twenty seconds. Uh, so it is actually all over the place, but we didn't have YouTube, did we? We didn't have everything at the drop of a hat. No, and uh, not everybody at the concert had a, a, a smartphone in the pocket either. So, <laughs> so, uh, so those, those that actually filmed it, I mean, finding something like that must be really special. When you yeah, I mean, I, the, 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 I, I, I've bought some that obviously people did a dupe copy, and you know, obviously you could go to the labs and either have a, an egg made or, or, or even just sort of uh, the, they just run co copies of it. So potentially. There might only be two copies of that, but there might be hundreds because you don't know who's put that out for that. If the amount of people I, I, I've talked to who collected 16 mil uh, and they had a 16 mil trailer of, say, Girl Happy, uh, but they would copy, have it made at the lab into an 8 mil print so they could swap it with a friend who yeah. would then, they would copy it and sort of, it was like, like sticking VHS machines together in a row and and sort of lo losing another generation 
you just got scratches. And also, if you, your shin on ripped it apart, that's what was on the master. <laughs> yeah. And, and there, as you have said, it was a different time back then. How did that also affect the way the collectors worked? You have talked a little bit about that, but can you elaborate a little yeah, bit? Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I feel that if you were an Elvis record collector, People kept them pristine and they wanted the, the right cover. I, th I see so many here, even though they came in the clamshell box or what they might, well, we'll spool a few together. So it's all on a 1200 foot and the box went and it was kind of a disposable medium. I think just to, to a lot of people, it, it, it was a means to an end rather than, than collectible where, where now, you know, I, I can buy a GI blues in a white box with a, a scribble on the front. And, and But to me, I'm not interested in that. I want the proper box. So it's it's very odd that the market is, is different because some people just want to have GI Blues. It's in my collection. So yeah. I, I'm a bit I'm a bit sort of of a purist, I suppose, that I want the, the original packaging. So people will argue with me now and say they've made their own box you know they've cut up an lp cover and made a gorgeous box but i haven't included it in the book because it wasn't legit it wasn't the you know the one it was issued with so so collectors i think there's elvis is is a love him or hate him when the movies they you know those 60s cheesy films were uh yeah, yeah, well, I think like a Doris Day film or a Martin and Lewis, they were they were the, they were good fun, weren't they? Uh, as we we mentioned at the start, you you used to work at Durand, and Durand got the deal for some uh, of the Elvis films. Did you in any way get involved in that? I, I guess you must have been interested at least. Do yeah, you I, I mean, I, I was a little bit later on, so all right. Uh, yeah. So so I. I, I when I was there, it was nice that the second-hand market was where, you know, if, if a collection got bought in, I'd be having a, a sort of lean over and go, oh, I, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a trailer for uh, Easy Come, Easy Go there. And, and uh, put that aside and I'll buy that one. Put that aside and I'll buy that one. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, once you get the first picks, that's, yeah. that's pretty nice. Yeah, but, but, but really when I was you know, quite young then, when the features came in, they were still very expensive. So I didn't yeah. have any features for ages because that was just a different world to sort of a poor little chap. Uh, so I say like, so come 1990 when I was sort of putting adverts in, in things, it was nice to be able to get the, um, the Viacoms at a decent price in the proper box. And they looked, you know, they looked gorgeous. Um, so, you know, and, we would show them at events sometimes as well. It was it was really good. Films, uh, as we know, everybody that collects films knows that uh, they degrade over time. Um, so collecting them is is uh, <laughs> it's something special. You 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 know uh, the colors won't last forever. I mean, we have better types of of, of films uh, that have come in in later years. But you mentioned something in the book that I uh, was thinking about, and that was that. Dig digitizing this when when like fan filming shows up and digitizing it how important that is uh, before uh, it degrades too much you, you know this is the frightening thing that you know somebody's granddad went to see elvis in 74 filmed it and it got through out when he died and you're thinking yeah. you know it's gone once it's gone it's gone uh, but a lot of people did transfers early on uh, and, and when vhs were you know there was point point a camera at it so they didn't transfer it digitally and it's those you know are they still sitting in the loft that they need to get out and get digitalized because that that 1992 uh handy cam version of it is still not great is it <laughs> <laughs> no so when you worked on this book uh did you learn anything new or get a new perspective on something during the work oh uh, oh yes i mean there were things that i'd never seen before were, were great sort of like an italian release and japanese releases in there i'd never even heard talk of those uh some of the german releases um i'd, I'd read about for years but never never got uh like the the elvis the movie German one so it's quite interesting to watch that now dubbed 
uh, because I'd never really got involved in any of the dubbed ones. Uh, it was all the you know the Durans and the, and the Viacoms, so that that was interesting. But but people um, offering me films uh, and films that weren't legitimate releases that people were buying to make it cheaper. They would buy one Elvis song in black and white on a fifty footer. Uh, and it should have been in colour, but they just kept the costs down. So people were buying that. They, they were handheld, instead of a projector, these little handheld viewers. That the non, you know, people who weren't keen on eight mil, they just wanted to see Elvis move, would have these weird little contraptions. And I bought one of those because I'd only ever heard of them, and I managed to get one on eBay, and put a little fifty footer in it, and with a battery. And it's shocking, but that's because we're spoiled now, isn't it? You know, but if, if like I say in the book there, people, they, you could buy a, a Beatles stuff and they would give you that for like $4 on top. And that must have been brilliant, is not yeah. it? To, to yeah. sort of go, you know, I could say, but they were silent again. These little machines didn't, didn't have a soundtrack. Um, so, yeah, so things that were uh, optical sound uh, that I hadn't really come across before. So, oh, that's another another section i've got to do the scope i never really got into scope on eight mil i never had had the equipment my, my mate did uh but but i never got down down that route so so that was interesting to see a blue hawaii as it should be uh, and it just makes you you wish that you know something like blue hawaii had been put out uh by duran like when they were doing the the disney's you know if it had come out in that sort of quality uh, that would have been amazing, um, you know. But it's all what if again, isn't it? We got Blu-ray now, haven't we? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, we're quite spoiled. You can find anything on YouTube if you want to look for it. But for me, that's part of the reason why I like to collect uh, films on reels because then I can get back to something where it really means something to find something, not just yet another movie of some sort. It's oh, finally I found that I was been I've been looking for for like three years or whatever. And then I get. A, for me, that's um, that was born in 1977. I may perhaps I get a little taste of how it was like to find something back in the day. Yeah, yeah, that, that's it. I, I, I do think it's funny now when looking at it, where the amount of people uh, that think you know this 200 foot Laurel and Hardy must be worth 200 pounds because it's old, and you, got to, <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. You know, it, it's a Walton, it's in a battered box. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the difference of two reels where one perhaps is a, a, a fan film and the other is a common release, uh, that's quite different. So uh, when I got this book, I must mention I got that as a birthday present from my parents. Um, so uh, so that was uh, really nice. And if the listeners also want to have this experience of reading this book, uh, where can they go to find your book? Uh, well, the easiest way is go to uh, my website, which is www.8mm8mmelvis.com. So 8mmelvis.com. And uh, you can go on there. It's it's click whether you're Europe. Um, I've sort of broke it down with the postage. So it's, it's British. Uh, Europe, America, rest of the world. So you can click on and the, the postage is, has been calculated there. Um, so then it's just sit back and wait. Uh, and I will include a link to the, to that page in the show notes so the listeners can find it there. And a little bird has told me that uh, you have already been ordering the second print of the book uh, because it Yes, well. yes, it, it, uh, we, we've had those a couple of weeks ago now that uh, the, the next batch came in uh, and it's lovely. I mean, it still just amazes me because, you know, I never thought I was, it was never a thing I was going to do, write a book. You know, it, it was never a dream or anything that I would seriously do it. You know, I played around with it, but it's out there. It's legit. It's got a ISBN number. It's in the British Mu uh, Library. So it, it's a real book. Yes, it's. I'm so pleased about it, with it. So for the listeners that might be interested in this book, yeah, the tip of the day would be to to make sure you order this before the second batch is also out of print. Because who knows how many batches uh, wins will will do before it's empty, and when it's gone, it's gone. 
you know, when I when I first thought about doing this, I thought, well, who's going to be interested? And I, I thought, do I do a paperback? Do I do this? And I thought, no, I, it's it's the one book in my life I'm going to do. Um, make it sort of a, a glossy one. Um, and then I think, you know, it, it doesn't just get thrown thrown on the shelf with a lot of, of other bits. Um, but it, it, it's something to have. Uh, I... I, I I'd say, yeah, if you like 8 mil, have a read of it. If you don't know your 8 mil, I've hopefully put enough in there to sort of educate the uh, the non-believers. <laughs> yeah, and I would say if you are into Elvis and not 8 millimeter films, I, I'm sure you will learn something about film. And But if you, like me, are into 8 millimeter films and not necessarily know too much about Elvis, I also appreciate reading the book to learn something more about the, the king of rock and roll. Uh, and it uh, clearly is a labor of love. So um, anybody out there, I would recommend you buy this book from Vince Wright. Is there anything you want to add before we wrap up? Uh, no, I mean, the, the, the only thing I, re I really thought of is at looking into this, I... I I've really got the bug for this. So if anybody thinks, oh, you missed something, tell me. You know, if there is something out there that completely uh, missed, I, I, I would love to hear about it. I did say what I've included and why, uh, but I, I've had Jailhouse Rock filmed off a of TV and then duped, uh, and I've got and somebody sent me a 400 foot of that. So I've had the weird things, but, you know, if that's what was out there, that's what was out there. Um, but yeah, let me know. If you enjoyed this episode and want to follow us, you can listen to us and subscribe to our podcast using players like Pocket Casts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Pandora and YouTube. You can also use any podcast player supporting RSS. Go to our website, hummingprojector.com, to learn how to subscribe. You can also listen to the current and previous episodes on our website without any additional software. If you have any feedback for this episode or a suggestion for a future episode, please send an email to feedback at hummingprojector.com. And with that, we have reached the end of this podcast. Go run and look for the book from Vince Wright. Uh, my name is Ian Moik, and with me, I have had Vince Wright. And thanks for listening. Thank you very much for having me.